Thank you for joining us here today on Hill Country Happenings News Minutes. The Teacher of the Year and Administrator of the Year of the New Albany School District was formally recognized at the January 13th school board meeting. Pictured on the front row is Nina Beth Kapani, New Albany Elementary School Teacher of the Year, Sarah Garrett, New Albany High School Teacher of the Year and District Teacher of the Year, Chelsea Hamilton, New Albany Middle School Teacher of the Year, Back row is Rick Robbins, School of Career and Technical Education Teacher of the Year, Gwen Russell, Principal of the New Albany Elementary School and Administrator of the Year, and Colin Stubblefield, the NASTUC Teacher of the Year. Now, the pictured students were selected as Outstanding Career and Technical Education students for the second nine weeks of the New Albany School of Career and Technical Education. Pictured are the students that were chosen. There were some of them from Health Science, some from Construction 2, some from Oral and Electronic Communications, some with Culinary Arts, Constructions, Concept of Drafting, Digital Media, Drafting 1, Early Childhood, Ag Animals, Health. There are so many great opportunities in the career and technical education part of our county. Congratulations to you all. The New Albany High School presents the ACT 30 Plus Club. The t-shirts go to the students that score 30 or more on the recent ACTs. Pictured are Bonnie Littlejohn, Anina Scales, and Jordan Brooks. Nearly 170 students have become members of the ACT 30 Plus Club since its creation in the fall of 2009. What a wonderful testament this is to our area schools. USA Dance, Charter 6125, right here in New Albany, has a new location for the month of January and February. They will be at 104 East Bankhead, that's the old Midtown Barbershop, located in the Henderson Building, right near the Trailhead Plaza. Now, classes are held every Monday night, and each month you can learn a new style of smooth rhythm or social dances. There's no partner necessary or needed. The 6.30 to 7.30 class costs $5 for members and $8 for non-members. This is an intermediate class. And then from 7.30 to 8.30 is the free newcomer class, which will be done the foxtrot for the whole month. There's a quote that the New Albany USA Dance Club uses. When you dance, your purpose is not to get to a certain place on the floor. It is to enjoy each step along the way. And this is a quote by Wayne Dyer. Now coming up January the 25th from 7 o'clock to 9.30 at the Midtown Barbershop at 104 East Bankhead Street is the pre-Super Bowl dance party. Now, the prices have changed. It's $10 for non-adult members and $8 for adult members, $5 for non-youth members, and $3 for youth members. Now, for more information about USA Dance Chapter 6125, you can call 316-3994 or 662-322-3741. And remember to save the date, February the 29th, that's a Saturday. This will be at the old Midtown Barbershop right here in the Henderson Building. Put on your dancing shoes and come dance. A Jerry Williams, a Deputy Commissioner of Institutions, who held the number two position at the Mississippi Department of Corrections, has announced that he is retiring effective Wednesday, January the 15th. As a deputy commissioner of institutions, Williams has been the point person for prisons for the correction commissioner. He worked his way through the ranks to serve four and a half years as a deputy commissioner. And like no other official currently, at the MDOC, Williams has managed both incarcerated and community supervision populations during his career. Deputy Commissioner Williams has done an amazing job, said Commissioner Hall. He has given his life to this department. She also said it has taken a team effort to manage our latest crisis, and DCI Williams has been at the front no matter the time of day and night. Williams, known for his tireless work ethics and make it happen mantra, said his immediate plans are to simply to rest. Now, the Magnolia Recreation and Resource Center, partnered with the New Albany High School, presents Valentine's Bingo. 
Now, the New Albany High School students will be leading an exciting Valentine's celebration of our 55 and plus community members. Join them for that day of fun and fellowship. It'll be Monday, February the 10th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Magnolia Civic Center. Join the Oxford Film Society in a special screening of the Frank Waldeck's It's Time, a dramatic telling of the story of Ole Miss Rebel football player Chucky Mullins, his tragic on-field injury, and its uplifting aftermath. The event will include a post-screening discussion of the film with actors and some of the people they portray in the film. Now, this will be at the Gertrude Ford Center at the Performing Arts. The tickets are $75, and half of the proceeds go to Chucky Mullins Foundation. We talked to Miss Melody Addington from the Oxford Film Fest. We've got a little bit of that interview in the Hill Country Happenings, and you can see the full interview on From the Heart Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. Mississippi State Research Professor is leading an international effort to advance off-road autonomous vehicle capability. Daniel Carruth, Assistant Director of Advanced Vehicle Systems at MSU Center for Advanced Vehicular Systems, is part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Research Task Group explaining vehicles modeling and simulation tools. The group will work through 2023 to determine standards for modeling and simulation tools allowing military and research personnel to more effectively develop algorithms that will allow vehicles to navigate off the road and unknown terrain. With mobility modeling, it was mostly about dynamics between the tire, the track, and the terrain it's driving on. With this study, you'll have more questions about the environment and the need to account for things such as trees, people, animals, and other obstacles. We're trying to take two domains that have advanced a lot over the last 10 to 15 years and bring them together to improve off-road vehicles. At CAVS, researchers use the MSU Autonomous Vehicle Simulator to test navigation software in virtual environments. Recently, MSU acquired 50 acres adjacent to the CAVS to also test autonomous vehicles in a variety of physical off-road environments. The center recently was awarded $3 million from the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center to support the Army's ground mobility research. Given that this activity is likely to result in a long-lasting methodology and are tools similar to current NATO reference mobility models, which is widely used in military acquisitions by NATO member nations, such development will be valuable investment for the future. The leadership and contribution provided by MSU's Dr. Daniel Carruth are extremely critical to the success of the NATO task group. Now, the CAVS is an interdisciplinary research center that uses state-of-the-art technology to address engineering challenges facing U.S. mobility industries. The center also impacts Mississippi and the Southeast by supporting economic development and outreach activities. For more information, visit cavs.msstate.edu. When it comes to defending America against the threat of missile attacks from any nation, President Donald J. Trump said today that the goal is simple. It is to ensure that we can detect and destroy any missile launch against the United States anytime, anywhere, and any place. President Trump gave his remarks at the Pentagon at an announcement of the release of the 2019 Missile Defense Review. The missile defense is so important in a time of rapidly evolving threats from around the world, he said. Adversaries are requiring bigger, stronger arsenals. They're increasing their lethal strike capabilities, and they're focused on building long-range missiles that can reach targets within the United States. As president, he said, my first duty is the defense of our country. President Trump then outlined six missile defense priorities, which he said will reflect in upcoming defense development budgets. First, 20 new ground-based interceptors are being constructed, which will bring the total to 64, he said. President Trump said the U.S. will work with allies on missile defense protection, such as prioritizing the sale of American missile defense and technologies 
so that we can defend as well. The U.S. will also share with the early warning and tracking to detect missile launches. The new missile defense initiative is not a strategy for a preemptive strike, according to the MDR. It is purely a defensive action. If deterrence fails and conflict with a rogue state or within a regional ensues, Russia and China have their own versions of the missile defense already, the review notes. And thank you for joining us here today on Hill Country Happenings News Minutes. We ask you to follow us on all of our social media. Go to our websites. Go to our Instagram and Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. Go and like us there and follow our page. We're all the time posting things, news and weather and upcoming shows. Also, speaking of shows, you can go to YouTube and go to our channel and subscribe. And when you subscribe and you hit that bell, you'll be notified every time we upload a new show, our new segment. There are so many things that happen in our area. We try to keep everyone aware. We also post the New Albany Board of Aldermen and the Union County Board of Supervisor meetings, and they are posted in whole. There's nothing cut out of them. All we do is put a beginning and an end to them, and that way you can see the whole meeting like you were right there. We hope that you will follow us on all of our social media and our YouTube and watch our shows. You know, we have 15 original programs that we air here. We still want a cooking show, so we would love to have you come in and cook something up for us or film it and send it to us. We can definitely talk about that. We show local church services, and we would love to have more church services because there are people that watch our channel and watch our website that aren't able to go to church. And so this is a way for them to feel a part of that community. We try to bring civic meetings when we have them about the city information, about the county information. And there's just a lot that happens. Now, we hope you'll stay tuned for the rest of the show, and we hope you have a wonderful week. I'm Sandy Schattinger with Hill Country Network, and today we're with Bobby Simpson in at the gallery in Ashland, Mississippi. So tell us all about I've, how long I've been here. How long you've been here? I've been here 40 years in this business. My husband passed away in 2012, and I'm still working at 94. Ninety-four. Wow, I that's wonderful. All right, well, so tell us how you're going to frame this picture. Okay, we will do the frame, of course, first after I measure the precise size, and then I'll mat all the way around it, and there'll be a mat down this way to cover up the little fold there. And who is hammering in the back? That is Will. Will Simpson. Grandson. Grandson. The youngest of my grandsons. As you can see by the posters on the wall, we are visiting the Oxford Film Fest office. This is like really cool. I've got Miss Melanie here with me. I'm going to let her introduce herself, tell you what her job is. Hey, I'm Melanie Addington, and I'm executive director of the Oxford Film Festival. I mostly work in this little box office year-round, answering emails and calling people and watching movies. Uh, and then they let me out for a week, yet once a year, <laughs> to uh, show movies at the Malco Commons and all over Oxford, Mississippi. Um, 208 movies this year from all over the world. Um, we're really excited. You said there's one international Oh, no. Uh, we have 14 countries represented, I believe, at least. There's there's quite a few. I th think uh, definitely Canada, Afghanistan, um, Japan. Yeah, there's a bunch. I don't have them all memorized yet. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> Last year, the ghost light was the 
premiere. Mm -hmm. What's this year's premiere? This year, actually, we're doing something a little different. It is the 30th anniversary of Pump Up the Volume, uh, starring Christian Slater and Samantha Mathis. And it was a pinnacle movie for teens of my age. And so since we were turning 17 and it was turning 30, I thought, let's put us together and do a fun uh, opening night that's a little different. So the director and the producer will be there. And there's some other surprises I can't tell anyone. So, <laughs> Of the larger movies, the, the full-length movies, what are some of those? Yeah, so um, we have a really great film called Freeland, which is premiering, world premiering at South by Southwest, and then we're getting it right after. Um, that's a narrative feature. Uh, we have another narrative feature I actually saw back in August in Dallas. Um, so it's been on the circuit this year. It's called The In-Between. And it's about these two really interesting women on a road trip. Um, one has a chronic illness. Actually, I'm sorry, both have a chronic illness of different types and sort of how they still experience life while dealing with those issues. And it's really funny and touching. Um, gosh, there's so many. Uh, we have a really fun world premiere of a Mississippi film called The Dinner Party. Miles Doliak, um, formerly of Hattiesburg, he just moved to New Orleans, but at the time they filmed it uh, in the Mississippi, uh, is world premiering. That's going to be a crazy, weird late night movie. <laughs> Not for everyone, but if you like weird stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, there's uh, all kinds of really great documentary features ranging in topics but one might be for a lot of people if they like the olympics it's called life and synchro and it's about synchronized ice skaters it's really good um so that's a, a nice fun one um yeah there's just there's so many there's really great mississippi films this year one's called the evers which is obviously about merle and, and medgar evers um sort of their legacy and even now what merle is doing um, and then there is one called You Asked for the Facts, and that is about Robert Kennedy's visit to Ole Miss not long after integration. So that's a real interesting, lot of great footage. So that's really great. Yeah, there's just a ton. So, <laughs> Is there a multimedia presentation or exhibit this year like there was last year? We are not doing a VR exhibit this year. There's actually a new VRcade here in Oxford. And so since it's here year round now, we're not putting it on. We were doing it because we were sort of the only ones showcasing it. But now that it's here, we feel like it's established. So we're not presenting it. Animations. Sure, yeah. So we have too many good experimental <laughs> films. We call it Fest Forward, and that's animation and experimental. So we actually broke it into two blocks. One is an animation block, which is your more traditional hand-drawn or digital, but it's more your traditional what you think of as animation. The other block ha is called experimental block, but it has some animation in it as well, but it's a little more edgy and weird, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> it's not for everyone, but it's definitely a fun to experience. It's definitely about getting an emotion out of you rather than telling you a story, so it's something different. What's up, everybody? My name is Chance. I'm Dee. And you're, and you're watching, watching the dog, dog feed. Today we're here with Coach Coburn. He's going to tell us about this upcoming softball season. How have you been preparing your players for this season? Well, we've done a lot of leadership training, but at the same time, we've uh, uh, incorporated hitting and fielding uh, throughout the week, a lot of weight room time. Um, but I think the biggest thing is um, the leadership and the Creational leaders throughout the team uh, at every grade level. What are your goals for this team? Uh, I want to see uh, improvement offensively and defensively, uh, playing together as a team, um, but, and then giving ourselves an opportunity to um, compete for the district championship and make a playoff run. What do you think is going to be your team's biggest strong suit this season? I think we're going to do a good job at the plate this year. Seen tons of improvement in the cage uh, in the off season. Uh, we've gotten a whole lot stronger. Um, the fundamentals have gotten a lot better. And so I think uh, the biggest improvement is the plate. What's up, everybody? I'm here with senior baseball player Charlie Lott. Uh, Charlie, is it okay if I ask you a few questions about the upcoming season? Sure, Adam. 
All right, well, Charlie, with the graduating class, including Tucker Owens and Cody Roberts and all them boys, how do you think y'all are going to be this year? Uh, I'm excited about this year. Um, those guys were, for sure, a big help. But um, proud of our senior class. They're going to be pretty good. And um, we've been working hard in the fall season. Those guys who are playing football like me and Drew, I know Jacob Benefield has been working real hard, too. What are some things you did this offseason to improve for this upcoming season? Um, well, we've been going to the bullpen to hit in the cage a bunch. Um, all of us have been going up there a bunch. Coach has been coming up there and locking it, uh, especially during Christmas break and Thanksgiving. And, um, you know, we've just been working on some throwing drills pretty much uh, team-wise even during fourth block. So that's pretty much it. I got you. Uh, and North Pontotoc, they won the state championship last year in 3A. Are you, like, how do you feel about them being in our division this year? Well, they're for sure a good team. Um, but, you know, we've been working real hard this all season. We're confident in what we can do this year. And, you know, we could be just about as good as last year, if not better. So we're pretty excited for the season. Uh, Charlie, with you and Drew Bantz being the captains of the baseball team, what are some things y'all are going to do to lead this team to be successful this year? Uh, you know, just lead by example, lead some of the younger guys that just got here, like the freshmen. We have a bunch of freshmen. And um, really just set an example of being on time, working hard at practice, and um, just uh, pretty much bringing everything you have every day. All right, everybody, that concludes my interview with Charlie. Charlie, thanks for coming today, and good luck this season. Thanks, Adam. What's up, guys? I'm Dorian. I'm here with Mitchell Shettles, and we're going to talk a little bit about basketball. So, Mitchell, what did you think about the game last night? Well, uh, we got down early, but uh, we were able to fight back and make some shots there at the end of the game to uh, pull out a good, tough division win on the road. Um, and what do you, what's your expectations for the upcoming Yin Kane tournament? You know, I feel pretty confident about it. We, uh, we have West Union Friday night at 5.30. And uh, we played them twice, and we're not going to overlook them. We're going to go into the game like, uh, like you know, they're one of the top teams that we play. And then uh, Saturday, if we win, we'll play Saturday against Inglewood in the championship, and uh, that'll be a good rematch for us. And another question. As a senior, what what's some of the things you think the younger guys who are playing on the team, they can improve on in the upcoming games and into the future? You know, our younger guys, I think experience is their big, uh, is the biggest thing that they need. Uh, the more experience they get, the the more prepared they'll be for late game situations or uh, you know high intensity, um, big environment games. Well, guys, you heard it. Thank you, Mitch, for being on. All right, what's up, guys? It's Coach Ball here with senior point guard Isaiah Ball. Um, we'll talk about basketball. So, he had an ankle injury earlier, right? Earlier in the season. Talk about that and how that process went. Um, I sprained my ankle when we played North Pontotoc, running behind the play on a fast break. And I accidentally stepped on the back of his foot and twisted my ankle. So, I've been going to therapy with Chase, and he's been helping me get better. And I um, missed two games, then I came back and played against Carden. That was a division game. How was that, that first game back against Carden? Uh, it was tough. I mean, it's still, I can still feel the pain, but I mean, I really didn't have a choice because I wanted to be out there with my guys. Right, right. so we get the big division win against Carden. Mm -hmm. And then the next game, we play Ripley. Talk about that Ripley game and the environment around the game. Um, playing Ripley is always a big game. You know, we've always been rivals since we were in middle school. But our team, we just kind of came out sluggish, and we really weren't ready for that game. And Ripley, you know, they took it to the heart because it was playing them, and it was a big division game. So they just wanted it more than we did. Right, let's skip it over a couple of games. The Neymar game. Um, good battle back and forth. Um, talk about the Union County Tournament coming this week. I know we played card last week, or last night, actually and got the win, but talk about potentially facing them in the championship game. Um, playing Ingemar again, I mean, it's always fun to me playing Ingemar because, you know, everybody come out and watch both of us because both our teams are always good. You know, we lost to them the first game. We fell short, and I feel like we got them this time playing New Albany. So. Okay, so what were some of your best memories from the county tournament? Not your senior, you've played in a couple of them. 
My best memory was, bro, don't ask me, ask me something else. <laughs> <laughs> Put, that, Put that in there. I'm not. You're not single? No. Shout out to my babe. Who is babe? Where's babe from? Oh, I can't tell you all that, but she knows. She knows. Babe, whoever you are, it'd be nice for you to reveal yourself. Babe, whoever you are, it'd be nice for you to reveal yourself. Babe, you are, it'd be nice for you to reveal yourself. <laughs> oh. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so your freshman year, you got to play with your cousin and your brother. Talk about that. Being being able to play with family. How was that? Uh, it's hard. It's hard playing with them at times. Like, oh Lord. Like it's fun being on the team with your brother and your cousin because you know you always got somebody to like keep you going there and practice when you're down. You know. They push you a lot during practice, but it's kind of hard being on the same team as them because you argue all the time at points, and you know it's just it's fun, but then it's hard at the same time. Would you rather play with them or have me coach you? I'd rather have you coach me there. Yeah. <laughs> right answer. Right answer. Right answer. All right. Um, so you've had two different coaches in high school. Talk about that, the transition from going with one coach into another. Um, my first coach was Coach Burdett, and it was kind of different because he came from a different playing style to New Albany, and it was kind of different for me because I was so used to just playing free and playing like whatever I wanted to do, basically. And he like put in more plays for our team to run, and it was kind of different. It was a different playing style, but when we got Coach Shells, you know, he found out that everybody on our team was, like, athletic and can score real good. So, he put in the playing style so we can all, like, just play free and stuff. Pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. Well, it's Coach Ball here with senior guard Isaiah Ball again. Thank you. Thanks for watching the dog feed. Yeah. Come back next Friday. <laughs>
He's leaning against a, uh, and a piece of his equipment, and it's obviously in between the seasons. You know, he's done the harvesting, and now he's waiting for the planting season to arrive. One of the metaphors here is the idea of being in a, uh, a place or a time where you're, where you're not productive. It's like a, a seed planted in the ground. It's in between the planting and the, and the, and the blossoming. And that's one of the metaphors, the idea of that in between time. <clears throat> yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what, what I do with a painting uh, in gathering the information, I, I photograph. And and I take the photographs as my starting point. Uh, I, I was visiting my parents, and we're going back a, a long time. This was back about 1985. And I had had this idea of, of a farmer in the, in the winter for probably 15 years. And I had done a lot of sketches of how I'd put it together but I had not put the actual models together for, for a photograph of, upon which I could base the painting. And I was telling my dad about it, who, who had been a farmer up until the time he was about 15 years old, uh, until his father died and my dad escaped from Randolph, Mississippi to Oxford, Mississippi when he was about 16 years old and he went to work for the mafia but that's another story uh, a good story too I might add um, and so he said hey I'll dress up he hated farming by the way he he didn't want anything to do with farming um, he said I'll dress up like a farmer and we'll go out there and we'll find this setting that you've told me about and uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can come up with so he got dressed. That's his idea of what a farmer would look like. And um, we drove out of town, and it was it was Christmas Day. And the and the and the and we were looking and looking, and the sun was starting to really get low. And I looked over at a farm house, and I said, hey, "There's the there's there's the machine I'm looking for." So we jumped out, ran over there, and I, I took maybe. A, 15, 20 shots of him posing different ways. And the light was just perfect. The, the light was exactly what I had in mind. And um, of course, you can't get that on, the, on a camera. You, you, know, you, can't, you can get a little bit of it, but you can't really capture that light on a camera. It has to be done in paint. Um, and so he had all, when I did this painting, I was making my living at, at painting at that time, but my dad was still not convinced that that's what I should be doing. He, he thought I should be employed by someone and, and, and you know, with health care and retirement and all that sort of thing. But when he saw this painting, he changed his mind. He liked that I, had, that I was an artist. So, okay, next. These are watermelon harvesters, and, and, and the name of this painting is Buried Treasure. This, metaphorically, is a, is a, a person who's he's, he's at the age where he's just graduated from some of these stories I'm, I'm telling tonight are in the book. There's an extensive interview in the book that was conducted by my son, and if you have a book or purchase a book, I encourage you to read it because I, I talk about a lot of ideas behind the work. Uh, he's just graduated from high school. Now he's going out into the world and <clears throat> because you know that's what the world, the society makes you do that. They make you 
leave your home, leave your loved ones, and get out there and bust your butt in the in so-called real world, in real society, in the adult world. Well, I've yet to find a, a, a true adult. <laughs> I'm, I'm still looking, though. Uh, so he, he's out there walking down. He knows he's getting ready to go out into the world, and he's 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 counting the ties the railroad ties and so that's a metaphor he's also he's counting the literal ties but he's also counting his ties that he's about to have to cut okay this has a, a, the idea of uh, uh, it's a, it is what you see it's an abandoned service station but this has to do with <coughs> The infinite and the containment. And this containment. You've got two opposite things happening there. Okay. I'm not going to dwell in, in, in on these and talk too much. Um, okay, this, I was, oh, and I'm not going to get detail too much about this, but I was in a, in a kind of a down kind of depressed, stressed out situation and I, I walked over to, and I saw this and it gave me hope because you're, you're ascending the stairs and then you're ascending, you know, pointing you up, pointing you to the zenith. I should have called this, I almost named this painting right, I named it Zion, but that's close to zenith. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have a, a country scene. Next, uh oh, bad slide. Anyway, that's these. These are trucks. Um, that's uh, this particular painting is landscape, still life portrait all together. Okay, Mary. This is a scene in Oxford. Um, each year, the St. Peter Episcopal Church sell pumpkins to help raise money. And they look like disciples. Uh, is that what you call somebody that goes to charity? Mm -hmm. um, the idea, my grandmother, one of the things I loved to do as a child is, is go to her canning closet and there was one bulb hanging from the ceiling and, and stand in that canning closet and, and study her jars of, of vegetables and fruit, jelly. And, and as an adult, <clears throat> I was looking for a metaphoric subject that I could make a commentary on containment primarily. Um, and, and I, I thought of this, and it was the perfect uh, subject, because I, what I was trying to do is I was trying to, to represent us as, as, as we're containers. We're all containers, and we, we, what we are containing is what some people will call a spirit, soul, some people call it a soul, but it's our identity. It's a thing that, it's, it's, it's composed of who knows what, but our bodies are, are containing that thing. Let's call it a soul. Let's call it a soul. But event, and no, okay, so these jars are containing nourishment and beauty, too. I mean, you know, the colors, <clears throat> the shapes, the forms, uh, the idea that, that, that this will help you stay alive if you need to eat it, um, but like the jars, which will eventually have the lids turned and opened and the contents become something else, that's what's going to happen to us. And that's what I was trying to, to depict in this whole series of paintings. It's not just the beauty of the, of the objects, but this idea that our, eventually our souls are going to become something other than they are now. We're going to leave this container. No one knows 
what that's going to be, but it's going to be different. Okay. And we're, we're following this idea of containment. Uh, this happens to be seven sauces here. Yes, seven deadly sins. Uh, this is one of my one of my favorite paintings because when I was about three years old, maybe four, my grandfather, who lived out in the country, decided that we'd go fishing at this uh, some kind of a creek or something back behind the field behind his house, and so my grandmother fixed us some biscuits and jelly and bacon. I can still remember how good they were. Um, and we had a little paper sack and off we went. Well, while my, we didn't stay there long because the mosquitoes were so bad that it was just a nightmare. But anyway, my grandfather's trying to fish and um, I was standing there watching these insects fly down and light on the water and stay, you know, for maybe 15 seconds or so. I assume they were getting a drink of water and then fly off. It might be a wasp, it might be a, uh, uh, what do they call those things with multiple wings? Dragonfly. There, there were drag in fact, what I'm going to refer to in a minute was a dragonfly. And I was fascinated with that. And so a, a dragonfly came down, lit on the water, and all of a sudden there was some disturbance underneath, and something whoosh, grabbed it and took it down. Well, that took away part of my innocence, uh, childhood <laughs> innocence. And so I'm commenting on childhood here and, and the beauty of childhood, and, and before you start thinking about so many of the of the less positive things in life, like death, and like the uncertainty of things, and this this to me is is that dragonfly sitting there on that surface of that water just before it happens, something else happens. Okay. Now. I, when I painted this painting, after I painted it, um, there was a, a, a gallery out in uh, Santa Fe that were having a group show, and I was represented by the by the gallery, and so they wanted something of mine. So I sent them this. It was, it, I just finished it, and it was a lady who owned the gallery, and she refused to show it in her gallery because it was guns, guns, and she was totally against guns. And this was way back in the early 90s. She, she would be happy today to see what's going on with guns. <laughs> um, but you see, they're cap guns, they're kids' toys, and it's making the peace sign. Goodness, okay. My friend uh, Howard Barr, a writer, you may know, probably have his books here in the library. Uh, I was over at his house one day and I saw th his dolls. He had them on the mantle. And I said, what's the story behind those dolls? He said, my grandmother made those. And uh, they're called uh, bottle dolls, bottle dolls. And, and she would take uh, wine bottles and that's what these, the structure of uh, underneath there are two wine bottles. And that for, that's how she built them. These things on top of the wine box. <clears throat> um, I said, "Can I take those out on the on the porch, out in the sunlight, and and photograph them? I think that'd make a good painting." And he just happened to have that rocking chair sitting out there on the porch, and it was a perfect composition. I was also wanting to see if I could paint something that complex, with all the pattern and the lace the light. Okay, Mary. 
fire, my fireworks series, again, we have the idea of containment and something being in one form, beautiful to look at, promising in what it might do, but when the fuse is lit, it's going to become something else beyond what it is now. <clears throat> I, I always try to, whenever I put these compositions together, I train myself decades ago not to think of how difficult this painting is going to be to paint. Or I, I might not have ever even attempted to paint it if I think about that. Uh, I just think about what's going to make a good painting. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll make a composition so hard that during the course of the painting, I'm wondering if I can pull it through, pull it off. But I'm happy to say, I don't think I've ever lost a painting. Okay. Uh, um, a collector of my work once asked me, he said, Glenn Ray, how, I have a question for you. How can you paint glass, for example, when it's something that you can't see? I said, well, that's a good question. Okay. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, you see that this is starting to lead toward my comic book and Marvel series. I'm playing around with this flat background, which looks flat. Um, and, and the very, those bar, the um, very three-dimensional objects in front. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. This this painting is was a commission painting from one of the one of the biggest collectors of, of art, contemporary art in America or in the world, for that matter. Um, Mark Parker. Does anybody recognize that name? Hmm. No, but that's close. Nike. Nike. Uh, he's been the head of Nike for the last 15, 20 years. And he, he commissioned me to do this. He, wa he, wa he had already bought a couple uh, for his collection in my Marvel's comic book series with the, with the monochromatic background. But he asked me, he wanted something big, and he asked me, did I have any ideas about a color background? And I said, yeah, I do. I, I think I, I got something in mind. And the funny thing is, <coughs> some of these comic books, although I've changed certain elements, visual elements of them, were some of my favorite comics as a kid. And, and I, he didn't know what I was painting. He just wanted another series in the Marvel comic book series, large, with a colored background. And, and when I finished painting, sent it to him, lo and behold, I find out that he's a big science fiction fan. And he actually owns the original art to a couple of these comic books that he bought on the, on the resale market. Total coincidence. Once we get past this series, we can go ahead. I think that's about the end, isn't it? You can leave. Let's just let's just stay right here for a minute. <clears throat> you know the whole um, the whole motif of 20, 20, late nineteenth century and twentieth century art started really seriously by. Matisse and Picasso with their cubism is that if you paint anything realistically a three, that looks three-dimensional, you're lying to the viewer because what you have is a flat surface and you cannot have something exist on flat surface that, that is three-dimensional. And so that brought about cubism. Well, that, that started a chain reaction in the art world that eventually led to 
abstract expressionism, which did away with Picasso and, and Brock, there were recognizable objects in their paintings. There might be two eyes on the same side of the head so that it was flat. You know, there's a person, but you can't have, you, 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 it's, it's hard. So the abstract expression said, we've solved that problem. You don't recognize anything. Our paintings, it's just paint. And it's, it's, you know, how much flatter can you get than that? It's paint on the canvas. Uh, one body at, uh, was visiting Jackson Pollock's studio. He's the guy that you know had the buckets of paint that he would swing around and, on, and put his canvases on the, on the floor and uh, put the cans of paint with rope and fill the paint cans and punch holes in the paint cans and spread them around. And somebody was visiting his studio, and he, they said, "Oh, look at that face." He said, "Face, where?" Right there. He said, mm hmm. <laughs> Fix that problem. Um, but somebody else came along and said, Well, to me, Pollock and Klein, it looks to me like I can see through these little <coughs> strokes of color. I can see, it looks like I'm looking into space. I mean, that's pretty deep. That's not flat. So somebody like Rothko says, Oh, well, I'll solve that problem. And so I'll just stain the canvas, just flat stain, and you can't see through that. And somebody says, "Well, I think I can because it looks like a kind of a, uh, oh, oh, kind of an opaque curtain to me, and and it looks like I'm looking at some light beyond the curtain." Well, you know what it all eventually led to something called conceptual art, from which somebody just hung a frame on the wall for example, or threw a log out in the middle of the floor and said, okay, beat that. <laughs> well, they just about had put themselves into the corner and destroyed art. But pop art saved this whole movement. Pop art reintroduced, this was going back to the 60s, reintroduced subject matter to painting. And I'm telling you, these collectors were tired they wanted, they were starving for, for imagery, something they could recognize. Um, by the late 50s, uh, paintings were selling, but, but the market was way down because the abstract expressionism was, was ruling the art world. Um, and so people like Warhol, uh, Jasper Johns, some of the pop, first pop artists said, well, what they did was they would take a picture, a photograph of, say, Elvis Presley in a, in a movie magazine, or Marilyn Monroe, and then they would simply reproduce that photograph that they found in a magazine. Might be a, 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 a bowl of spaghetti or something like that, but they didn't take a picture of the bowl of spaghetti. They found it already existing in a magazine because, remember, you've got to maintain this flat rule. And so, Often they would use silk screen technique and photographically put that photograph onto the silk screen and make a print. Warhol, of course, called them paintings, but they're really prints. Um, and so they, they, you had imagery, but you also had the, the doctrine of, of the flatness existing too because they said, well, it's just a it's just a picture, a photograph. You can't get any flatter than that. You know, it's, it's not a real camel soup can. It's a photograph I took of the camel soup cans and simply put it on canvas. Well, critics bought that, uh, and, the, and, the, and the collectors were happy because they had something they could say, well, that's a camel soup can, or that's the... Um, uh, uh, chunk of butter or whatever. Um, and what really happened at, at the end of the 60s is the photorealist mu movement came about. And now in the early days, in the 70s and, and most of the 80s, the term photorealism, hyperrealism, superrealism was interchangeable. And, and people like Richard Estes, Robert Cottingham, 
Ralph Goings. There was about 12 artists starting in by 1969, 70, who started to take a photograph of a, of, well, I'll use Estes, for example, of, of the street, a street in, uh, in New York City, Manhattan. And, and he would reproduce it, and it was extremely detailed. It, it, he, he made it look exactly like that photograph. And the, the, the collectors loved it because we were going back now to like, uh, uh, p people didn't think a painting that detailed could be done, but these photorealists were doing it. They didn't have any metaphor. It was just what you saw. It was a pickup truck. It was a pickup truck. Don't go any farther than that. If a, a street in Manhattan, uh, Broadway, let's say, you know, famous, uh, what street is that? Times Square. You know, that's all it was. No meaning beyond that. And they would tell you that in article after article. And, and they, the critics kind of distrusted them at first, saying, it looks to me like this looks three-dimensional. Uh, and, and, and the photo real said, well, it's not because we're just reproducing a photograph. You can't get any flatter than a photograph. Huh. It worked. So everybody was happy. But then people like me came along. I hear there's two others that, that started the movement that's called hyperrealism now. I'd like to know who those two other people are. I would like to know where that article came from and if it names these other two people, because I think I'm the one who started. But uh, what we have now in hyperrealism, and there's a group of artists that are doing it, uh, we're working in metaphor. Now, I'm working in metaphor in a poetic way. A lot of the, there's only a handful of so-called hyperrealists, but the other guys are, are commenting socially on things. They might do a painting of a, homeless person and comment socially on, a, on a, what they're painting, the subject. Um, so what I'm doing is I, I never bought into the flat thing. I never bought into it because, and we're getting to the, back to the why I call this two infinities. There's the quantum, well, let me start with the cosmic. There's the cosmic, infinite thing that's going out. You know, think of solar systems and galaxies. You know, there's just to the naked eye, through a telescope, there are billions of galaxies. You know, it's mind boggling. And that's just the ones they can see teles through a telescope. Uh, uh, so it goes beyond, I mean, it's, it's infinite cosmic world. And then there's the quantum infinite world. So that, the, 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 you know, the, it goes to molecules, atoms. What makes up an atom? It's got to be made of something. So it just goes on and on, just the same w way the cosmic realm is going, only this is going the opposite direction. Well, that disproves, that, or that proves that that canvas is not flat. That canvas is made up of atoms and the quantum endless infinity. So 20th century critics are completely wrong. And as soon as some smart art critic catches on to what I'm talking about, and I stated in the book, and then writes about it, I don't know if there's a, the then it's going to change the whole concept of, of art. But the problem is, I don't know if there's any intelligent art critics out there. <laughs> That's got me worried. <clears throat> okay, Mary, you can proceed. That's the full painting. Larry and I only use part of the painting on the, on the book jacket, but that's the whole painting. Okay, Mary. We've already seen that. Well, no, there's something else in there. Okay, that's m myself in the studio with a painting in progress. Okay, now what I'm going to do now is open it, this up because we're running out of time for any questions you might have concerning technical aspects, philosophical aspects, intellectual aspects, anything you want to ask.